lot about Mugler recently. Okay, maybe it's Zendaya's autumn winter 1995 look that she turned out for the June premiere in London as one of her two looks. Maybe it was that, okay, that triggered something inside of me that was like, do you wanna know what? Let me have a think about Mugler. Is it on shaky ground? Can they survive in 2024? What have they done to get to this place? Guys, if you are new here, my name is Cassie and I'm a self-diagnosed luxury addict. I put out videos on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. So if you like luxury fashion, then you're gonna love it here. So head on that subscribe channel bell, become a member of our luxury addicted family. When are we going to rehab? <laughs> Never. So I think that in order to really get into the weeds of this, because this is a very interesting kind of, um, semi-deep dive, we've got to look into the background because this is a brand that has a lot of very rich, interesting history that lends itself to be very successful in today's day and age. So the brand was started in the 70s by Manfred Thierry Mugler, who is sadly no longer with us, but he himself as like a person was a very sort of larger than life character that fed into his designs. He has made some incredible iconic designs over the years. Cardi B had a kind of, um, there were like a few red carpets that she went to in like vintage uh, Mugler, obviously something like the Zendaya Dune 2 premiere. If you remember Irina Sheik wearing the motorcycle corset, the designs are very costumey, powerful, provocative, sci-fi inspired, very sort of high glamour. Then in 1992, Angel Perfume came out, right? And then as we know, I mean, Angel is one of the most recognizable, and again, to throw the word around, iconic perfumes ever. Somebody will walk past wearing Angel, and I know it's Angel. I used to be obsessed with that perfume growing up. My mum was obsessed with the perfume growing up. She would get like the gift sets at Christmas that had the body cream and the this, and there was the star in it. And then she was wearing Angel, and my dad was wearing Amen, then there was B-Men. Anyway, right, it's like, it holds, a, it holds a little soft spot in my heart and growing up and whatever, but that became absolutely ginormous. And a lot of the time now, if you're like not into uh, fashion and all of that, that will be what people think of when you say Mugler. Now they were owned by Clarins. And in 2003, the ready to wear fashion side of the business was closed down because it was like making losses, it wasn't profitable. Manfred retired in I think 2002 or like 2004, around that time. But obviously fragrance and beauty was kept. Jump forward seven years to Nicola Formichetti. If you know, you know. If you're a little monster and a Lady Gaga fan, you know this man. Um, he was like her stylist for years and all of that. He took over Thierry Mugler and renamed it to just Mugler. And again, though, it was one of those things that like, if you weren't a little monster and following Lady Gaga steps, you would not know much about this brand, right? It was, you know, ticking along, but not to the lengths that like, we're really talking about it. In my memory anyway, right? I might be like massively skewed, but I would put money on it saying that like, we weren't really hearing much. In 2013, David Comer took over as creative director. Again, ticking along, maybe some crickets. In 2017, everything kind of turns around with Casey Cadwallader being the new creative director. And this is the Mugler that we now know. Here comes the revival. And if we're being honest, there was really one item that got Mugler in everybody's mouths again. It was controversial, it still is, but it did what it set out to do, which was to get people talking, to get people wearing it, for it to be viral, and to put Mugler on the map again. And those were the spiral jeans. You've got a pair of stretch denim skinny jeans that have this lycra cutout that looks like you're wearing a denim thong and looks really kind of risque without actually showing anything at all. Later on, there would be a version of this that you take out the lycra, you put in the mesh. So actually, yeah, that is like my bare bums that you're seeing, bums. So we have to, bum is, bum is a plural, it comes as a set anyway. But with that first kind of design of it, it was just the denim and the lycra. 
And this went everywhere. It was such a thing because it was so different from a lot of the things that we'd seen before. Like I said, it was risque, it was interesting. It was like, oh my gosh, is that really, I need to try these on, right? Like I need to go and does it actually look like I'm wearing a denim thong, could I get away with this? I remember being out for dinner in London at the time and um, this girl walked into the restaurant in it and I was like, oh my gosh, she looks amazing. I need to go and try those jeans on. They became very popular. And then they started coming out in different versions, different colors of denim, different materials, and also the bodysuits, the spiral bodysuits that were sort of, those were more of an illusion thing. So the mesh was done so that obviously you can just see through to the skin. And then you had these sort of lycra pieces that made the, the bodysuit look deconstructed on the body. I also do really like the fact that with Mugler under Casey's designs, the mesh comes in two colors. You have a lighter mesh and a darker mesh, and you can still get that very kind of um, optical illusion, very realistic look of the piece on the body, no matter the skin tone. Not everybody was into them. Not everybody was out here buying a spiral bodysuit and a spiral pair of jeans. Some people thought that it was, oh my gosh, absolutely hideous. But at least it builds the intrigue, right? It gets people's eyes going over to it. It gets, okay, I see that they do this spiral bodysuit thing. That's maybe not for me. But is there anything else they're doing? It was very, very commercial. It was easy to sell. It sold very, very well. They did custom stage outfits for Dua Lipa, Beyonce, Cardi B. But this is where it becomes hard because then you have this balance of when you have an item that is so popular and doing so well, how much of what you do next is to keep doing that in every variation under the sun, in different materials and blah, 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 and how much of it is okay, we need to now deviate from this before that's all we're sort of known for. And there is the aspect of like, do we just ride the wave of it and, you know, take advantage of, of how popular it is? Because now the spiral bodysuits, like I said, they're in every color. There's lace, there's crystals, leggings versions, in normal leggings, in a flared legging. There's different jean styles. There's like a baggy jean style that has it. To the point that I would say we've got a little bit of spiral fatigue. It has become a Real Housewives favorite. There was a tweet that kind of went viral or something not that long ago that was talking about, you know a trend's dead or something when it turns up in every confessional's look. I've got my sp a spiral bodysuit that is very much a, a winner in my eyes, but I kind of get what they're saying. Spring Summer 2023 show came along and we saw the introduction of the brand's first bag. Now, as we know, this is a category that for designer brands in general, is the one that performs the best for them. It's the one that brings in the money, all of that. We love a sodding bag. You don't need to tell me this, okay? I'm not got, I've not got the right background, but you get it. You know how I feel about a good handbag. And I actually think that the execution of it was quite interesting. I liked how they reinterpreted the spiral into a bag that was different. Um, it has movement. I like this bag particularly when it has the top handle because the top handle was sort of kind of similar to what Bottega does with the sardine bag but it's this metal top handle I think it matched with the shape of the bag really well the only thing with this bag was they did a lot of variations of it out of the gate which again means that that's something that like you see if it works and then you branch out they just dropped a whole load at one point to the point that maybe there was too much choice, I don't really know. And also, depending on the size that you get with this bag, it can be quite bulky. It's quite a wide bag that I think that they could have trimmed a little bit off there to make it fit under the arm a little bit better, fit crossbody along the body a little bit better. So there were tweaks here and there. And look, I don't have the numbers of like how much this sold, but based on the fact that I am chronically on the internet and scrolling and following all of these fashion pages and people and everything, seen much of this bag at all which is a bit of a shame because like I said I think that the top handle of it is really cool um, I think it's a very cool interesting bag but I don't think it had the success that they necessarily wanted it to have and of course 2023 brought with it the H&M collaboration and what was different about this H&M collaboration compared to designer collaborations with H&M of past was this was really the first time again in my memory that I saw a brand replicate what they had done for mainline for hundreds or thousands of dollars for their H&M collaboration. 
in a copy and paste kind of way. It was like, okay, you can buy the Mugler mainline spiral jeans, or you can get the H&M jeans that to anybody's bare eye looks exactly the same. Was there a difference in quality? Yes, slightly. But really, unless you are touching and putting yourself in it and everything else, you're not really going to know the difference between the H&M version and the mainline version of these pieces, which was, Genius in the fact that a lot of the pieces sold out, right? Because a lot of pieces are like, oh my gosh, I can get Mugler that looks like Mugler for not Mugler prices. But then it means for the regular Mugler customer who had been buying Mugler before the H&M collaboration, you're like, well, I could have just bought all of this for like 100, 200, 300 pounds, dollars, whatever, instead of paying the $900 for whatever this thing was at the time. Like, why would you buy the mainline version after that? Did the H&M collaboration pretty much kill off the spiral trend? Maybe. So from then on, the brand almost has to have a shift because it's not going to be as easy to be selling those mainline H&M spiral pieces, no matter how many colors you put it in. The last time I sort of checked, like, you know, quite a few of the pieces you can get on sale now. Again, does that tell something? So you have to shift as a brand into something else to sort of departure away from that and be like, okay, we can still give you something interesting and different and unique that's not like everything that we've sort of done over and over again. However, the one thing that was a part of the H&M and Mugler collaboration was they sort of reissued two vintage Thierry Mugler looks as part of that, right? And this is what I think the brand needs to do more of. The other thing that I think that we have to touch on is there is an overarching kind of trend in luxury fashion at the moment, which is, as much as we don't like it or whatever, the sort of quiet luxury of it all. We're seeing things that are a little bit more minimal, a little bit more pulled back. Something like a neon spiral bodysuit isn't really what people are gravitating towards at the moment. I know, speak for yourself, I might be, but I'm just talking about in general what we're seeing with like purchase patterns and all of that. Um, so there is the element of like, does Mugler need to shift into something that, that as a brand, it's not quiet luxury, right? It's definitely more of the loud luxury in their own way kind of style, which I love for them. And I don't want them to deviate from that. But do they need to interpret things in a different way that sort of suits what people want to buy at the moment a little bit more. For example, reintroducing classic blazer styles from vintage Mugler that I sort of, I see that they've been kind of doing this, right? With one particular, I think it's called like the signature blazer or something. That's a very kind of like um, vintage style that they've reworked for now. And that, I think, if they're going to stay alive, and look, I'm not saying like they're on the brink of death, oh my gosh, save them. I don't know any of the figures and the numbers and any of that business. But I'm just saying, if they want to be talked about as part of a constant conversation, then I think that, especially now when we're really interested in vintage, and I know that we're also sick of seeing reissues from some brands. Some brands are doing too much. This brand needs to be doing more because Mugler's history and archive is so good and such a really, really key part of the brand. Like that is what we want from them. And also this isn't a brand that used to mass produce. So even if you wanted to find Thierry Mugler vintage pieces, that's not easy because the pool of items is very small, which almost gives more ammunition for them to start reissuing, look into the archives, tweak things a little bit for the modern customer and get that out there. So that is really where I think that they need to go in order to continue to experience the success that they've been used to with the spiral trend. I do think that some new season pieces are kind of doing that, but if you look on the Mugler kind of fashion site, it is very much still the sort of spiral Mugler. There's a really, really great jacket that they have come out with again. That seems like that kind of very structured, very tailored look that was a core part of Thierry Mugler back back in the day. And those are the sorts of things that I think they need to be going down. So people are going, oh my gosh, Zendaya wore this vintage Thierry Mugler thing at June. Let me have a look at what Mugler is doing. You need to have a collection that's gonna back that up. The pieces that are going viral at the moment, shockingly, are things like the Romar Go Bag, things like Mew Mew. They're sort of like inoffensive and they're not, 
you know, those kind of like provocative and really unique pieces that maybe like a couple of years ago were going viral. I mean, that's not, you've got something like mischief, right? But I'm just saying in the grand scheme of like luxury fashion, you've then got to, okay, if you want one of these viral moments, it's got to be more down this route. I don't even know if I'm making a good point here because it's not all about having a viral product, but I think because the Spiral collection was so viral and it got so many people talking, that's why I'm kind of connecting the two, even though I know that the popularity and longevity of a luxury brand doesn't have to be down to these viral moments. But look, they're showing around the time that this video comes out. Maybe I'll be proved wrong. Maybe it will be an incredible show that's full of like these kind of like vintage reissued pieces that are just incredible. Maybe I'll fall in love with the Spiral Collection again. I don't know. But either way, I wanted to sort of voice my thoughts. <laughs> I like Mugler. I have a lot of, a lot. I have, you know, a few Mugler pieces, bodysuits, trousers, um, a denim jacket, all of that. And I really like the piece. I like the quality and I really like the brand. I think it's interesting. I think it's different. I think it has a really, really amazing history that can be tapped into. That I think a lot of people would like to see more of. Let me know what you think and if I made any sense. I'm going to leave a link to another video over here in case you haven't already seen it. Have an amazing morning, afternoon or evening wherever you are and in the words of my father. If you've enjoyed it, tell your friends. If you haven't, keep your mouth shut. I'll see you in my next video. Bye guys.